Matthew, Chapter 1 Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible An Exposition, with Practical Observations, of The Gospel According to St. Matthew Chapter 1 This evangelist begins with the account of Christ's parentage and birth, the ancestors from whom he descended, and the manner of his entry into the world, to make it appear that he was indeed the Messiah promised, for it was foretold that he should be the son of David, and should be born of a virgin, and that he was so is here plainly shown, for here is. 1. His pedigree from Abraham in forty-two generations, three fourteenths, verses 1 to 17. 2. An account of the circumstances of his birth, so far as was requisite to show that he was born of a virgin, verses 18 to 25. Thus methodically is the life of our blessed Saviour written, as lives should be written, for the clearer proposing of the example of them. Matthew 1 verses 1 to 17. Concerning this genealogy of our Saviour, observe. 1. The title of it. It is the book, or the account, as the Hebrew word sepher, a book, sometimes signifies, of the generation of Jesus Christ, of his ancestors according to the flesh, or, it is the narrative of his birth. It is Biblis Geneseo S.A. Book of Genesis. The Old Testament begins with the book of the generation of the world, and it is its glory that it does so, but the glory of the New Testament herein exileth, that it begins with the book of the generation of him that made the world. As God, his outgoings were of old, from everlasting, Micah 5 verse 2, and none can declare the generation, but as man, he was sent forth in the fullness of time, born of a woman, and it is that generation which is here declared. 2. The principal intention of it. It is not an endless or needless genealogy, it is not a vainglorious one, as those of great men commonly are. Stemata, quid facient, of what avail are ancient pedigrees? It is like a pedigree given in evidence, to prove a title, and make out a claim, the design is to prove that our Lord Jesus is the son of David, and the son of Abraham, and therefore of that nation and family out of which the Messiah was to arise. Abraham and David were, in their day, the great trustees of the promise relating to the Messiah. The promise of the blessing was made to Abraham and his seed, of the dominion to David and his seed, and they who would have an interest in Christ, as the son of Abraham, in whom all the families of the earth are to be blessed, must be faithful, loyal subjects to him as the son of David, by whom all the families of the earth are to be ruled. It was promised to Abraham that Christ should descend from him, Genesis 12 verse 3, 22 18, and to David that he should descend from him, 2 Samuel 7 verse 12, Psalm 89 verse 3, etc., 132 colon 11, and therefore, unless it can be proved that Jesus is a son of David and a son of Abraham, we cannot admit him to be the Messiah. Now this is here proved from the authentic records of the herald's offices. The Jews were very exact in preserving their pedigrees, and there was a providence in it, for the clearing up of the descent of the Messiah from the fathers, and since his coming that nation is so dispersed and confounded that it is a question whether any person in the world can legally prove himself to be a son of Abraham, however, it is certain that none can prove himself to either a son of Aaron or a son of David, so that the priestly and kingly office must either be given up as lost for ever or be lodged in the hands of our Lord Jesus. Christ is here first called the son of David because under the title he was commonly spoken of and expected among the Jews. They who owned him to be the Christ, called him the son of David, chapter 15 verse 22, chapter 20 verse 31, chapter 21 verse 15. Thus, therefore, the evangelist undertakes to make out, that he is not only a son of David, but that son of David on whose shoulders the government was to be, not only a son of Abraham, but that son of Abraham who was to be the father of many nations. In calling Christ the son of David, and the son of Abraham, he shows that God is faithful to his promise, and will make good every word that he has spoken in this. 1. Though the performance be long deferred. When God promised Abraham a son, who should be the great blessing of the world, perhaps he expected it should be his immediate son, but it proved to be one at the distance of forty-two generations, and about two thousand years, so long before can God foretell what shall be done, and so long after, sometimes, does God fulfill what has been promised. Note, delays of promised mercies, though they exercise our patience, do not weaken God's promise. 2. Though it begin to be despaired of. This son of David, and son of Abraham, who was to be the glory of his father's house, was born when the seed of Abraham was a despised people, recently become tributary to the Roman yoke, 
and when the house of David was buried in obscurity, for Christ was to be a root out of a dry ground. Note, God's time for the performance of His promises is when it labors under the greatest improbabilities. 3. The particular series of it, drawn in the direct line from Abraham downward, according to the genealogies recorded in the beginning of the books of Chronicles, as far as those go, and which here we see the use of. Some particulars we may observe in the genealogy. 1. Among the ancestors of Christ who had brethren, generally he descended from a younger brother, such Abraham himself was, and Jacob and Judah, and David, and Nathan, and Risa, to show that the preeminence of Christ came not, as that of earthly princes, from the primogeniture of his ancestors, but from the will of God who, according to the method of his providence, exalted them of low degree, and puts more abundant honor upon that part which lacked. 2. Among the sons of Jacob, besides Judah, from whom Shiloh came, notice is here taken of his brethren, Judas and his brethren. No mention is made of Ishmael the son of Abraham, or of Esau the son of Isaac, because they were shut out of the church, whereas all the children of Jacob were taken in, and, though not fathers of Christ, were yet patriarchs of the church, Acts 7 verse 8, and therefore are mentioned in the genealogy for the encouragement of the twelve tribes that were scattered abroad, intimating to them that they have an interest in Christ, and stand in relation to him as well as Judah. 3. Phares and Zara, the twin sons of Judah, are likewise both named, though Phares only was Christ's ancestor, for the same reason that the brethren of Judah are taken notice of, and some think because the birth of Phares and Zara had something of an allegory in it. Zara put out his hand first, as the firstborn, but drawing it in, Phares got the birthright. The Jewish church, like Zara, reached first at the birthright, but through unbelief, withdrawing the hand, the Gentile church, like Phares, broke forth, and went away with the birthright, and thus blindness is in part happened unto Israel, till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and then Zara shall be born all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verses 25 and 26. For, there are four women, and but four, named in this genealogy, two of them were originally strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, Rachab a Canaanitess, and a harlot besides, and Ruth the Moabitess, for in Jesus Christ there is neither Greek, nor Jew, those that are strangers and foreigners are welcome, in Christ, to the citizenship of the saints. The other two were adulteresses, Tamar and Bathsheba, which was a further mark of humiliation put upon our Lord Jesus, that not only he descended from such, but that is decent from them is particularly remarked in his genealogy, and no veil drawn over it. He took upon him the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8 verse 3, and takes even great sinners, upon their repentance, into the nearest relation to himself. Note, we ought not to upbraid people with the scandals of their ancestors, it is what they cannot help, and has been the lot of the best, even of our master himself. David's begetting Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias is taken notice of, says Dr. Whitby, to show that the crime of David, being repented to, was so far from hindering the promise made to him, that it pleased God by this very woman to fulfill it. 5. Though divers kings are here named, yet none is expressly called a king but David, verse 6, David the king, because with him the covenant of royalty was made, and to him the promise of the kingdom of the Messiah was given, who is therefore said to inherit the throne of his father David, Luke 1 verse 32. 6. In the pedigree of the kings of Judah, between Joram and Osias, verse 8, there are three left out, namely, Ahaziah, Josh, and Amaziah, and therefore when it is said, Joram begot Osias, it is meant, according to the usage of the Hebrew tongue, that Osias was lineally descended from him, as it is said to Hezekiah that the sons which he should beget should be carried to Babylon, whereas they were removed several generations from him. It was not through mistake or forgetfulness that these three were omitted, but, probably, they were omitted in the genealogical tables that the evangelist consulted, which yet were admitted as authentic. Some give this reason for it, it being Matthew's design, for the sake of memory, to reduce the number of Christ's ancestors to three fourteenths, it was requisite that in this period three should be left out, and none more fit than they who were the immediate progeny of cursed Athaliah, who introduced the idolatry of Ahab into the house of David, for which this brand is set upon the family, and the iniquity thus visited to the third and fourth generation. Two of these three were apostates, and such God commonly sets a mark of his displeasure upon in this world they all three had their heads brought to the grave with blood. 7. Some observe what a mixture there was of good and bad in the succession of these kings, as for instance, verses 7 and 8, wicked Roboam begot wicked Abia, wicked Abia begot good Asa, good Asa begot good Josaphat, 
good Josaphat begot wicked Joram. Grace does not run in the blood, neither does reigning sin. God's grace is his own, and he gives or withholds it as he pleases. 8. The captivity of Babylon is mentioned as a remarkable period in this line, verses 11 and 12. All things considered, it was a wonder that the Jews were not lost in that captivity, as other nations have been, but this intimates the reason why the streams of that people were kept to run pure through that dead sea, because from them, as concerning the flesh, Christ was to come. Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, even that blessing of blessings, Christ himself, Isaiah 65 verses 8 and 9. It was with an eye to him that they were restored, and the desolations of the sanctuary were looked upon with favor for the Lord's sake, Daniel 9 verse 17. 9. Josias is said to beget Jeconias and his brethren, verse 11, by Jeconias here is meant Jehoiakim, who was the firstborn of Josias, but when it is said, verse 12, that Jeconias begot Salathiel, that Jeconias was the son of that Jehoiakim who was carried into Babylon, and there begot Salathiel, as Dr. Whitby shows, and, when Jeconias is said to have been written childless, Jeremiah 22 verse 30, it is explained thus, No man of his seed shall prosper. Salathiel is here said to beget Zorobabel, whereas Salathiel begot Padiah, and he begot Zorobabel, 1 Chronicles 3 verse 19 but, as before, the grandson is often called the son, Padiah, it is likely, died in his father's lifetime, and so his son Zorobabel was called the son of Salathiel. 10. The line is brought down, not to Mary the mother of our Lord, but to Joseph the husband of Mary, verse 16, for the Jews always reckoned their genealogies by the males, yet Mary was of the same tribe and family with Joseph, so that, both by his mother and by his supposed father, he was of the house of David, yet his interest in that dignity is derived by Joseph, to whom really according to the flesh he had no relation, to show that the kingdom of the Messiah is not founded in a natural descent from David. 11. The center in whom all these lines meet is Jesus, who is called Christ, verse 16. This is he that was so importunately desired, so impatiently expected, and to whom the patriarchs had an eye when they were so desirous of children, that they might have the honor of coming into the sacred line. Blessed be God, we are not now in such a dark and cloudy state of expectation as they were then in, but see clearly what these prophets and kings saw as through a glass darkly. And we may have, if it be not our own fault, a greater honor than that of which they were so ambitious, for they who do the will of God are in a more honorable relation to Christ than those who were akin to him according to the flesh, chapter 12 verse 50. Jesus is called Christ, that is, the anointed, the same with the Hebrew name Messiah. He is called Messiah the Prince, Daniel 9 verse 25, and often God's anointed, Psalm 2 verse 2. Under this character he was expected, Art thou the Christ the anointed one? David, the king, was anointed, 1 Samuel 16 verse 13, so was Aaron, the priest, Leviticus 8 verse 12, and Elisha, the prophet, 1 Kings 19 verse 16, and Isaiah, the prophet, Isaiah 61 verse 1. Christ, being appointed to, and qualified for, all these offices, is therefore called the anointed anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, and from this name of his, which is his ointment poured forth, all his followers are called Christians, for they also have received the anointing. Lastly, the general summary of all this genealogy we have, verse 17, where it is summed up in three fourteenths, signalized by remarkable periods. In the first fourteen, we have the family of David rising and looking forth as the morning, in the second, we have it flourishing in its meridian luster, in the third, we have it declining and growing less and less, dwindling into the family of a poor carpenter, and then Christ shines forth out of it, the glory of his people Israel. Matthew 1 verses 18 to 25. The mystery of Christ's incarnation is to be adored, not pried into. If we know not the way of the Spirit in the formation of common persons, nor how the bones are formed in the womb of any one that is with child, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5, much less do we know how the blessed Jesus was formed in the womb of the blessed Virgin. When David admires how he himself was made in secret and curiously wrought, Psalm 139 verses 13 to 16, perhaps he speaks in the spirit of Christ's incarnation. Some circumstances attending the birth of Christ we find here which are not in Luke, though it is more largely recorded here. Here we have 1. Mary's espousal to Joseph. Mary, the mother of our Lord, was espoused to Joseph, not completely married, 
but contracted, a purpose of marriage solemnly declared in words de futuro that regarding the future and a promise of it made if God permit. We read of a man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her, Deuteronomy 20 verse 7. Christ was born of a virgin but a betrothed virgin. 1. To put respect upon the marriage state, and to recommend it as honorable among all, against the doctrine of devils which forbids to marry, and places perfection in the single state. Who more highly favored than Mary was in her espousals? 2. To save the credit of the blessed virgin, which otherwise would have been exposed. It was fit that her conception should be protected by a marriage, and so justified in the eye of the world. One of the ancients says, it was better it should be asked, is not this the son of a carpenter? Then, is not this the son of a harlot? 3. That the blessed virgin might have one to be the guide of her youth, the companion of her solitude and travels, a partner in her cares, and a help meet for her. Some think that Joseph was now a widower, and that those who are called the brethren of Christ, chapter 13 verse 55, were Joseph's children by a former wife. This is the conjecture of many of the ancients. Joseph was just man, she a virtuous woman. Those who are believers should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but let those who are religious choose to marry with those who are so, as they expect the comfort of the relation, and God's blessing upon them in it. We may also learn, from this example, that it is good to enter into the married state with deliberation, and not hastily to preface the nuptials with a contract. It is better to take time to consider before than to find time to repent after. 2. Her pregnancy of the promised seed, before they came together, she was found with child, which really was of the Holy Ghost. The marriage was deferred so long after the contract that she appeared to be with child before the time came for the solemnizing of the marriage, though she was contracted before she conceived. Probably, it was after her return from her cousin Elizabeth, with whom she continued three months, Luke 1 verse 56, that she was perceived by Joseph to be with child, and did not herself deny it. Note, those in whom Christ is formed will show it, it will be found to be a work of God which he will own. Now we may well imagine, what a perplexity this might justly occasion to the Blessed Virgin. She herself knew the divine original of this conception, but how could she prove it? She would be dealt with as a harlot. Note, after great and high advancements, lest we should be puffed up with them, we must expect something or other to humble us, some reproach, as a thorn in the flesh, nay, as a sword in the bones. Never was any daughter of Eve so dignified as the Virgin Mary was, and yet in danger of falling under the imputation of one of the worst crimes, yet we do not find that she tormented herself about it, but being conscious of her own innocence, she kept her mind calm and easy, and committed her cause to him that judgeth righteously. Note, those who take care to keep a good conscience may cheerfully trust God with the keeping of their good names, and have reason to hope that he will clear up, not only their integrity, but their honor, as the sun at noonday. 3. Joseph's perplexity and his care what to do in this case. We may well imagine what a great trouble and disappointment it was to him to find one he had such an opinion of, and value for, come under the suspicion of such a heinous crime. Is this Mary? He began to think, how may we be deceived in those we think best of? How may we be disappointed in what we expect most from? He is loath to believe so ill a thing of one whom he believed to be so good a woman, and yet the matter, as it is too bad to be excused, is also too plain to be denied. What a struggle does this occasion in his breast between that jealousy which is the rage of man, and is cruel as the grave, on the one hand, and that affection which he has for Mary on the other. Observe. 1. The extremity which he studied to avoid. He was not willing to make her a public example. He might have done so, for, by the law, a betrothed virgin, if she played the harlot, was to be stoned to death, Deuteronomy 22 verses 23 and 24. But he was not willing to take the advantage of the law against her, if she be guilty, yet it is not known, nor shall it be known from him. How different was the spirit which Joseph displayed from that of Judah, who in a similar case hastily passed that severe sentence, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Genesis 38 verse 24. How good it is to think on things, as Joseph did here. Were there more of deliberation in our censures and judgments, there would be more of mercy and moderation in them. Bringing her to punishment is here called making her a public example, which shows what is the end to be aimed at in punishment the giving of warning to others, it is in terrarum that all about may hear and fear. Smite the scorner, and the simple will beware.
Some persons of a rigorous temper would blame Joseph for his clemency, but it is here spoken of to his praise, because he was a just man, therefore he was not willing to expose her. He was a religious, good man, and therefore inclined to be merciful as God is, and to forgive as one that was forgiven. In the case of the betrothed damsel, if she were defiled in the field, the law charitably supposed that she cried out, Deuteronomy 22 verse 26, and she was not to be punished. Some charitable construction or other Joseph will put upon this matter, and herein he is a just man, tender of the good name of one who never before had done anything to blemish it. Note, it becomes us, in many cases, to be gentle towards those that come under suspicion of having offended, to hope the best concerning them, and make the best of that which at first appears bad, in hopes that it may prove better. Summum just summa injuria the rigor of the law is, sometimes, the height of injustice. That court of conscience which moderates the rigor of the law, we call a court of equity. Those who are found faulty were perhaps overtaken in the fault, and are therefore to be restored with the spirit of meekness, and threatening, even when just, must be moderated. 2. The expedient he found out for avoiding this extremity. He was minded to put her away privily, that is, to give a bill of divorce into her hand before two witnesses, and so to hush up the matter among themselves. Being a just man, that is, a strict observer of the law, he would not proceed to marry her, but resolved to put her away, and yet, in tenderness for her, determined to do it as privately as possible. Note, the necessary censures of those who have offended ought to be managed without noise. The words of the wise are heard in quiet. Christ himself shall not strive nor cry. Christian love and Christian prudence will hide a multitude of sins, and great ones, as far as may be done without having fellowship with them. For Joseph's discharge from this perplexity by an express sent from heaven, verse 20, 21. While he thought on these things and knew not what to determine, God graciously directed him what to do, and made him easy. Note, those who would have direction from God must think on things themselves, and consult with themselves. It is the thoughtful, not the unthinking, whom God will guide. When he was at a loss, and had carried the matter as far as he could in his own thoughts, then God came in with advice. Note, God's time to come in with instruction to his people is when they are nonplussed, and it is stand God's comforts most delight the soul in the multitude of its perplexed thoughts. The message was sent to Joseph by an angel of the Lord, probably the same angel that brought Mary the tidings of the conception the angel Gabriel. Now the intercourse with heaven by angels, with which the patriarchs had been dignified, but which had been long disused, begins to be revived, for, when the first begotten is to be brought into the world, the angels are ordered to attend his motions. How far God may now, in an invisible way, make use of the ministration of angels, for extricating his people out of their straits, we cannot say, but this we are sure of, they are all ministering spirits for their good. This angel appeared to Joseph in a dream when he was asleep, as God sometimes spoke unto the fathers. When we are most quiet and composed we are in the best frame to receive the notices of the divine will. The Spirit moves on the calm waters. This dream, no doubt, carried its own evidence along with it that it was of God and not the production of a vain fancy. Now. 1. Joseph is here directed to proceed in his intended marriage. The angel calls him, Joseph, thou son of David, he puts him in mind of his relation to David, that he might be prepared to receive this surprising intelligence of his relation to the Messiah, who, everyone knew, was to be a descendant from David. Sometimes, when great honors devolve upon those who have small estates, they care not for accepting them, but are willing to drop them, it was therefore requisite to put this poor carpenter in mind of his high birth, value thyself. Joseph, thou art that son of David through whom the line of the Messiah is to be drawn. We may thus say to every true believer, Fear not, thou son of Abraham, thou child of God, forget not the dignity of thy birth, thy new birth. Fear not to take Mary for thy wife, so it may be read. Joseph, suspecting she was with child by whoredom, was afraid of taking her, lest he should bring upon himself either guilt or reproach. No, saith God, fear not, the matter is not so. Perhaps Mary had told him that she was with child by the Holy Ghost, and he might have heard what Elizabeth said to her, Luke 1 verse 43, when she called her the mother of her Lord, and, if so, he was afraid of presumption in marrying one so much above him. But from whatever cause his fears arose, they were all silenced with this word, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Note, it is a great mercy to be delivered from our fears, and to have our doubts resolved, so as to proceed in our affairs with satisfaction. 2. He is here informed concerning that holy thing with which his espoused wife was now pregnant. That which is conceived in her is of a divine original. 
he is so far from being in danger of sharing in an impurity by marrying her, that he will thereby share in the highest dignity he is capable of. Two things he is told. 1. That she had conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, not by the power of nature. The Holy Spirit, who produced the world, now produced the Savior of the world, and prepared him a body, as was promised him, when he said, Lo, I come, Hebrews 10 verse 5. Hence he is said to be made of a woman, Galatians 4 verse 4, and yet to be that second Adam that is the Lord from heaven, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47. He is the Son of God, and yet so far partakes of the substance of his mother as to be called the fruit of her womb, Luke 1 verse 42. It was requisite that his conception should be otherwise than by ordinary generation, that so, so though he partook of the human nature, yet he might escape the corruption and pollution of it, and not be conceived in shop and in iniquity. Histories tell us of some who vainly pretended to have conceived by a divine power, as the mother of Alexander, but none ever really did so, except the mother of our Lord. His name in this, as in other things, is wonderful. We do not read that the Virgin Mary did herself proclaim the honor done to her, but she hid it in her heart, and therefore God sent an angel to attest it. Those who seek not their own glory shall have the honor that comes from God, it is reserved for the humble. 2. That she should bring forth the Savior of the world, verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, what he shall be is intimated. 1. In the name that should be given to her son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, a Savior. Jesus is the same name with Joshua, the termination only being changed, for the sake of conforming it to the Greek. Joshua is called Jesus, Acts 7 verse 45, Hebrews 4 verse 8, from the 70. There were two of that name under the Old Testament, who were both illustrious types of Christ, Joshua who was Israel's captain at their first settlement in Canaan, and Joshua who was their high priest at their second settlement after the captivity, Zechariah 6 verses 11 and 12. Christ is our Joshua, both the captain of our salvation, and the high priest of our profession, and, in both, our Savior a Joshua who comes in the stead of Moses, and does that for us which the law could not do, in that it was weak. Joshua had been called Hosea, but Moses prefixed the first syllable of the name Jehovah, and so made it Jehoshua, Numbers 13 verse 16, to intimate that the Messiah, who was to bear that name, should be Jehovah he is therefore able to save to the uttermost, neither is there salvation in any other. 2. In the reason of that name, for he shall save his people from their sins, not the nation of the Jews only, he came to his own, and they received him not, but all who were given him by the Father's choice, and all who had given themselves to him by their own. He is a king who protects his subjects, and, as the judges of Israel of old, works salvation for them. Note, those whom Christ saves he saves from their sins, from the guilt of sin by the merit of his death, from the dominion of sin by the spirit of his grace. In saving them from sin, he saves them from wrath and the curse, and all misery here and hereafter. Christ came to save his people, not in their sins, but from their sins, to purchase for them, not a liberty to sin, but a liberty from sins, to redeem them from all iniquity, Titus 2 verse 14, and so to redeem them from among men, Revelation 14 verse 4, to himself, who is separate from sinners so that those who leave their sins and give up themselves to Christ as his people are interested in the Savior and the great salvation which he has wrought out, Romans 11 verse 26. 5. The fulfilling of the Scripture in all this. This evangelist, writing among the Jews, more frequently observes this than any other of the evangelists. Here the Old Testament prophecies had their accomplishment in our Lord Jesus, by which it appears that this was he that should come, and we are to look for no other, for this was he to whom all the prophets bore witness. Now the scripture that was fulfilled in the birth of Christ was that promise of a sign which God gave to King Ahaz, Isaiah 7 verse 14, Behold a virgin shall conceive, where the prophet, encouraging the people of God to hope for the promised deliverance from Sennacherib's invasion, directs them to look forward to the Messiah, who was to come of the people of the Jews, and the house of David, whence it was easy to infer, that though that people and that house were afflicted, yet neither the one nor the other could be abandoned to ruin, so long as God had such an honor, such a blessing, in reserve for them. The deliverances which God wrought for the Old Testament church were types and figures of the great salvation by Christ, and, if God will do the greater, he will not fail to do the less. The prophecy here quoted is justly ushered in with a behold, which commands both attention and admiration, for we have here the mystery of godliness, which is, without controversy, great, that God was manifested in the flesh.
1. The sign given is that the Messiah shall be born of a virgin. A virgin shall conceive, and by her, he shall be manifested in the flesh. The word Alma signifies a virgin in the strictest sense, such as Mary professes herself to be, Luke 1 verse 34, I know not a man, nor had it been any such wonderful sign as it was intended for, if it had been otherwise. It was intimated from the beginning that the Messiah should be born of a virgin, when it was said that he should be the seed of the woman. So the seed of the woman is not to be the seed of any man. Christ was born of a virgin not only because his birth was to be supernatural and altogether extraordinary, but because it was to be spotless and pure and without any stain of sin. Christ would be born, not of an empress or queen, for he appeared not in outward pomp or splendor, but of a virgin, to teach us spiritual purity, to die to all the delights of sense, and so to keep ourselves unspotted from the world and the flesh that we may be presented chaste virgins to Christ. 2. The truth proved by this sign is, that he is the Son of God, and the mediator between God and man, for they shall call his name Emmanuel, that is, he shall be Emmanuel, and when it is said, he shall be called, it is meant, he shall be, the Lord our righteousness. Emmanuel signifies God with us, a mysterious name, but very precious, God incarnate among us, and so God reconcilable to us, at peace with us, and taking us into covenant and communion with himself. The people of the Jews had God with them, in types and shadows, dwelling between the cherubim, but never so as when the word was made flesh that was the blessed Shechina. What a happy step is hereby taken toward the settling of a peace and correspondence between God and man, that the two natures are thus brought together in the person of the mediator. By this he became an unexceptionable referee, a day's man, fit to lay his hand upon them both, since he partakes of the nature of both. Behold in this the deepest mystery and the richest mercy that ever was. By the light of nature, we see God as a God above us, by the light of the law, we see him as a God against us, but by the light of the gospel, we see him as Emmanuel, God with us, in our own nature, and which is more, in our interest. Herein the Redeemer commended his love. With Christ's name, Emmanuel, we may compare the name given to the Gospel Church, Ezekiel 48 verse 35. Jehovah Shammah the Lord is there, the Lord of hosts is with us. Nor is it improper to say that the prophecy which foretold that he should be called Emmanuel was fulfilled, in the design and intention of it, when he was called Jesus, for if he had not been Emmanuel God with us, he could not have been Jesus a Savior, and herein consists the salvation he wrought out, in the bringing of God and man together, this was what he designed, to bring God to be with us, which is our great happiness, and to bring us to be with God, which is our great duty. 6. Joseph's Obedience to the Divine Precept, verse 24. Being raised from sleep by the impression which the dream made upon him, he did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, though it was contrary to his former sentiments and intentions, he took unto him his wife, he did as speedily, without delay, and cheerfully, without dispute, he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Extraordinary direction like this we are not now to expect, but God has still ways of making known his mind in doubtful cases, by hints of providence, debates of conscience, and advice of faithful friends, by each of these, applying the general rules of the written word, we should, therefore, in all the steps of our life, particularly the great turns of it, such as this of Joseph's, take direction from God, and we shall find it safe and comfortable to do as he bids us. 7. The Accomplishment of the Divine Promise, verse 25. She brought forth her firstborn son. The circumstances of it are more largely related, Luke 2 verse 1, etc. Note, that which is conceived of the Holy Ghost never proves abortive, but will certainly be brought forth in its season. What is of the will of the flesh, and of the will of man, often miscarries, but, if Christ be formed in the soul, God himself has begun the good work which he will perform, what is conceived in grace will no doubt be brought forth in glory. It is here further observed. 1. That Joseph, though he solemnized the marriage with Mary, his espoused wife, kept at a distance from her, while she was with child of this holy thing, he knew her not till she had brought him forth. Much has been said concerning the perpetual virginity of our Lord, see BLB note below, Jerome was very angry with Helvidius for denying it. It is certain that it cannot be proved from Scripture. Dr. Whitby inclines to think that when it is said, Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn, it is intimated that, afterwards, the reason ceasing, he lived with her, according to the law, Exodus 21 verse 10. 2. That Christ was the firstborn, and so he might be called though his mother had not any other children after him, according to the language of Scripture. 
Nor is it without a mystery that Christ is called her firstborn, for he is the firstborn of every creature, that is, the heir of all things, and he is the firstborn among many brethren, that in all things he may have the preeminence. 3. That Joseph called his name Jesus, according to the direction given him. God having appointed him to be the Savior, which was intimated in his giving him the name Jesus, we must accept of him to be our Savior, and, in concurrence with that appointment, we must call him Jesus, our Savior. BLB Note, from the context of this paragraph, it is clear that Matthew Henry is speaking of the supposed perpetual virginity of Mary, the mother of our Lord, not the virginity of Jesus.